So we got a gig at one of the biggest clubs in Fort Lauderdale called Dudas. It was enormous club. Cool. David lied to him. He didn't even have a band. So he calls me up and says, you got to get down here. We got two weeks to get ready to go play this place. So <laughs> the luxury of not having the internet, you could just make up stuff. Like no lie. And he did. <laughs> I don't know what all he told them, but they, they bought in. <laughs> excited about this one. It's, it's a guy that I've known for quite some time here in the Alabama music industry. Uh, he's sort of a, 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 a closed door legend, uh, which is why I would like wanted him to have, have him come on. But today in the studio, we have Dr. Ken Randolph. Doctor? So, Dr. Yeah, Ken Randolph. Right. Yeah. Man, we appreciate you being so here, What's up buddy? with the doctor? Thank yeah. you, guys. Yeah. I, I'm a I'm a chiropractor full time during the week. I thought he was about to say I'm a oh, doctor man. of love. No, <laughs> no, no. Nah, that was a long time ago. <laughs> okay. I'm too old for that now. We are talking about Key West. What were you about to say about Yeah, so well, can you what I, I walked in in the middle of your conversation, I just heard the tail end about going over across the Everglades. What were you saying now? Well, we we, we used to when I first started playing music in Florida. Uh, we we literally did East Coast, West Coast. We'd play a few gigs in the middle. But the very first time we ever did it, we started going across Gator Alley, and I'm like, geez, man, what is this? Yeah, so had the one gas station. Yes, right? one. The one. Literally you one. There. If you did you're, you're screwed. Out you're you're right. right. Yeah, and uh, going across, doesn't it tell you stay in your car yes. if you break down or something like that? And then there's like these call boxes. But anyways, yeah. Well, I found out why they tell you to stay in your car. Yeah. Gators, literally. Yeah. I'm talking about monster gators, yes. man. Uh-huh. Right on the side of the road. Mm-hmm. And so cocky me says, man, I'm going to get out and I'm going to get a picture. <laughs> <laughs> bad, bad idea. Because I decided ah, I can get closer. I can get closer. Yeah, he decided I wouldn't. Uh-huh. So, I did the I did some quick stepping. I did the same thing twice. One yeah. during the day and one at night. I was oh ba- shit! No way at a, night, man. I was in a band called Splendid Chaos, and we were going to Key West to play at Dirty Harry's. Rick's. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. And the first time we went there, it was during the day, and of course, you know, you see all the signs and all that stuff. So we did pull over and we did check them out. You know, they're just kind of lounging in the sun. We're like this is awesome. So then we come back. We went two weeks down there, and we come back, and it's at nighttime, and we're in the van. You know. Get a little sauce. Got up. cocky. And I, yep, got cocky. <laughs> yep. And uh, <clears throat> we had, you know, this was like 2001 and we had a VHS tape. And so I was like filming everything. So I get out there and I'm like, hey, it's nighttime. Let's go do it. So we go there and then I shit you not. You put that camera on there and you see nothing but eyes. That's right. And I'm the only one, you know, about maybe 10 feet from the van and trailer. And those sons of bitches, Mike Hall or Scott Franklin, take a rock, chuck it. Mm. hits by me i shit my pants i'm like you see the camera going i'm like running back i'm like what the hell but yeah that's a real thing there's gators like all i mean it's like on the screen yes yeah yeah hey i'll I'll tell you when that uh what was it jet blue that went down in the everglades Everglades outside of gator alley man it took them forever to find that plane i mean man people don't realize if you've never been across there that's about as desolate a place yeah. as I've Where is it? Is it like South Florida? Yes. So here, uh, Hold on a second. You've been through it. We one, drove right through the middle of it going to Key West. I yeah. didn't see a bunch of alligators on the side of the road. Because, oh, we, man. because we didn't stop. We, well, weren't, we weren't stupid except enough. Except the very so. Here. Yep. Bottom right there. there now you can cross. It's you the only way the you time. can go from east to west yes. if you want to go. It's down below uh, Naples, right. Naples, Naples, down below Naples. Naples. You yeah, go Naples. down below Naples, mm-hmm. and that's how you cut across to Lauderdale mm-hmm. yep. in Miami. Yeah. There mm-hmm. it is, Florida Bay, Everglades National yeah. Park. Yep. But it's uh, – yeah, you see like Panther Crossing, Gator it's, Crossing. It's crazy. It's, yeah. There's Panthers in the Everglades? Oh, my mm-hmm. God. Really? I thought the snakes have gotten everything down there except for the Gators. Have y'all not seen <laughs> that new guy on uh, – on uh i see he pops up in my reels all the time on like instagram it's called like florida wildlife or something it's a guy he literally barefoot walking through the everglades at night like doing the stupidest stuff you've ever seen picking up like his whole like his whole stick is is he's looking for a 20 foot uh python 
And so, but he has all these videos of him doing this stuff. And like, like you said, that picture just we saw with Gators, he'll be standing knee deep in the water and put his camera down with a light, and there'll be a twenty foot gator, and he'll be like, "Oh, look, a swamp puppy!" And he'll he'll go boop and slap it on its tail, and it'll take off. And I'm thinking, like, this dude is going to die. Yeah, it's going to be a short lived account. Yeah, he's from Florida. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what a big shock. All facts towards anybody. From. Right. So, Ken. <laughs> Yep. So, you know, one of the reasons uh, that, you know, I was talking to everybody about bringing you in is, is you know, a lot of people know you for your for your music career. Yep. Um, you know, you've been involved in the music scene in Alabama uh, for a long, long time. Um, and a lot of people know your, you know, your discography. You know, you've worked with Alabama. You've wor- I mean, you've worked with a ton of big names in the industry. So, I mean, tell me what it's like doing that, man. It's it's been I've been very fortunate. Yeah. I I've had a lot of relationships with a lot of different guys from different bands and a lot of the musicians I I played music with. Uh, Stevie Ray Anderson's played bass with me that plays with Aaron Tippin. Uh, Rusty Hendricks, who's a lead guitar player for Confederate Railroad and was with Sammy Kershaw, played with me a lot. Uh, Mo Thaxton, who was he's with Confederate Railroad, and before that he was with. Uh, Oh, when you were in love with the beautiful woman. Oh yeah, I can't think. I know. Of it. I know what. You're anyway, talking about. he w- he was with them. Uh, of course, Jeff Cook and I were really close friends for years. Did a lot of fishing together. Uh, one of my buddies, John Stone, who oh yeah, we've had John plays here, yeah. Tootsie's and plays Kid Rocks all the time, and uh, he and I actually played for uh, the Bushes at the White House. Yeah which was a huge deal for me, man. I I was so shocked when they called me. I, this is no lie. The girl calls me. She's talking to me on the phone. I think it's one of my friends, and I'm like, I let her talk for a minute, and I said, okay, who the hell is this? <laughs> and she like, I think she got offended, and she's like, no, I'm so-and-so from the White House. I said, nah, come on. Uh, and finally, I realized she was being legit, and I said, why are you calling me? She said, well, you you did this song called Tribute to a Soldier, and uh, I had recorded it with Charlie Daniels and Jeff Cook, yep. and they wanted me to sing it at the White House, and it was the last event they had for George Bush before he and his wife, before he went out of office. So it was a very cool experience. John Stone was part of the reason that I got to do that because John had made this girl that was Bush's secretary aware of the song, and they invited me. So that was a cool gig. We got to take the private tour of the White House. And, of course, me being the smartass that I am, (laughs) we get to the famous room where the chair is at. That uh, Bill Clinton? Yes. The infamous. And so (laughs) I, I immediately look at the guy and said, I'm begging you, will you please let me sit in the chair and take a picture? He said, I can't do that as much as I'd like to. <laughs> but I wanted a picture in that chair so bad. Heck yeah. But it was a, it was a cool gig. and, and uh, But, yeah, I, I have been. I've been very fortunate. I've uh, had songs recorded by Confederate Railroad, T. Graham Brown, Charlie Daniels, and, of course, Alabama. Alabama was my first one. Yeah. And uh, I had done an interview about six months before that happened, and – the guy said, if you could have anybody record one of your songs, who would it be? I said, one of two people. Either I, I'd like Garth Brooks or I'd love for Alabama. I had no idea that that was going to happen. But uh, when I first met Jeff, he used to come see us play at Billy Bob's all the time. Where's he, that? Where's Billy Bob's? In Daytona Beach. It's not even there anymore. Okay. Huge, high-end, glass brass club. It was Honky great top. great place to play yeah very country um and so jeff just wandered in one night and literally like walked up on the stage he walked over to me he said i want to play i want to have a good time just do not ask me to play an alabama song <laughs> i said no i said no problem dude and i'm telling you man he he rocked the place jeff is a was a huge uh oldies guy I mean, loved it. Yeah. If if you ever heard him, and a lot of people haven't, he could sound so much like Buddy Holly that you couldn't even tell that it wasn't Buddy Holly if you 
weren't watching him. It was amazing to hear him do that Buddy Holly stuff, but he was really into it. So we played a lot of oldie stuff that night. I got to be friends with him. He took me out back and played a song for me that was coming up on one of the albums. Well, he heard us do the song, and you know very well who I'm about to talk about, P.J. Kimberlin, who PJ. very good friend of yep. mine. He and I had written a bunch of songs together, and he heard me do the song that night. And I thought he was just being a nice guy, and he said, man, I love that song. He said, I may talk to Alabama about recording it. And so I what, thought, what was the name of the song? This Love's On Me. Yeah. So a few months go by. One night I'm on the stage playing at Billy Bob's, and a girl walks up with, of course, we didn't have cell phones then. She walks up with a portable phone and says, you got a phone call. I said, are you kidding me? We're in the middle of a show. She said, no, I think you're going to want to take this phone call. So we're the, the bar is full of people. And I take the phone, and Rocky Lawrence, who was Jeff's personal manager, said, hey, Ken, I got some good news for you. And I'd pitch two songs to him. Both of them, PJ and I had written. One was called uh, Till Eternity, and the other one was This Love's On Me. He said, I got good news and I got bad news. And he said, which one you want first? I said, okay, give me the bad news. He said, they're not going to record Till Eternity. And I thought that was the better song. Yeah. And so I said, okay, well, dang, what's the good news? He said, they're recording This Love's On Me. I said, man, don't be yanking my chain. <laughs> so when I hung up the phone, when I tell you we had a party, and I mean it lasted all night long. But Did you go buy you at Lamborghini just at the, th just no. at the news? Like, no, but, I, but I'll tell you this. This is how popular Alabama was. The very first check I got, I bought a brand-new Chevrolet pickup truck with it, and I was like, this is the life, man. Forget the playing music. I'm going to write songs. Yeah, right. <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. It's hard to believe. We had Bruce Ayers in here a couple of weeks ago, and he was telling a story about before Alabama hit, he had them play at his club, and he could not give tickets away. And it's just so funny to hear a band that had that many hits. This know? was before oh, this was before Alabama was famous. Oh, yeah. Like, right before oh, they yeah. hit. Before they hit. You know, you know what's crazy about that deal? Uh, when Alabama was playing Myrtle Beach and they were negotiating, the drummer, the original drummer, literally quit Alabama about six months before the contract got signed. I don't know if a lot of people know that, and painted houses for the rest of his life. Mm. I mean, can you imagine? And and I apparently never regretted it. And uh, how they I, I, stop. Now you know he regretted it. <laughs> I could, uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people who who spoke with him, and maybe in private, but he never showed it. I, and, I, and it always blew my mind. Maybe he had a good therapist, but trust and believe. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> painting then, houses versus it, playing drums for Alabama. And then he regretted. Mark Herndon it's less is less lowdown. Winds yeah. up <laughs> in the band because his mama meets Alabama. She's working at a hotel. She meets him and says. Hey, my son plays drums. I'd love for him to try out. That's how Mark Herndon got the Alabama job. I mean, how crazy is life wow. to to get get a break like that? And then the guy who'd played with them all those years, even when they were called Wild Country, before they were even anybody thought about them being Alabama. Yeah. So you think that old drummer is paint you know that museum they have up there in the cave for alabama oh. he's up there painting it going yeah i'm glad i quit this band <laughs> no way <in> hell. <laughs> he must have a lot of humility that's uh, what it is. <laughs> obviously but yeah I, you know it's crazy and so nine months went by even after i knew they were going to do the song and and uh i'm driving down the road the first time i ever heard it i'm in the in a my old truck Driving down the road, and the guy on, uh, I think it was 93, The Frog or something in Daytona, says, brand new song from Alabama. And I'm like, I, I mean, I went absolutely nuts yeah, driving down the road. And then it hit me, and I started crying. I'm like, man, I cannot believe this has actually happened. Oh, but hearing your song for the first time on the radio, it just... It hits different. Oh, it does. Yeah. I, I, you know, anybody who says it doesn't, you're a liar. Cause oh, I know. I remember the first the, time the, I heard our song. Oh, the emotion, man. Yeah. I, you know, and you, you think about all you did, and 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 the crazy part is, I didn't get serious about this. I I played in a band in high school. 
uh, with a group of guys that uh, Jeff actually played with for a while. And uh, I just I, – I, I, I never took it serious because I played sports. I went to uh, college on a scholarship, and I, it just wasn't – what I was thinking about doing, and I was 28 years old before I just genuinely got serious about it. And what happened was two two ladies from Florida that had heard me called me up. I was a policeman. You were a policeman? Yes, I was a policeman. I started out in Atlanta, Georgia. Believe wow. that for a guy from – a kid from Gwin, Alabama, my first police gig was Atlanta, Georgia. You talk about – an awakening to a real world right buddy i got one quick and i worked one of the worst sections in atlanta techwood homes up to about 14th street which is right downtown and you're lucky to be alive yeah well how long were you a policeman uh about 12 years um but Anyway, I didn't mean these to. two girls. Yeah, I want to hear about these two girls. Yeah. Are you about yeah. to say tell us you had a threesome? No, no, no. <laughs> they were they, they they were older, but they were back in a guy named David Spiegel, and uh, they called me up and said, uh, "We want to hire you to play acoustic guitar and be the band leader," because David was about to get a record deal, and it was called David Spiegel and Lone Rider, and so. I just wasn't really sure about it, but when they told me how much they would pay me, I'm like, you know what? I think I'm going to try this for a while. So (laughs) I gave up being a policeman, moved down there. I know I'm going to tell a lot of stories, but this is is one of those things that there's no way you'd ever believe it happened. So we got a gig at one of the biggest clubs in Fort Lauderdale called Doodahs. It was an enormous club. What was the band name? Uh, Lone Rider. Lone Rider. Okay. David Spiegel and Lone Rider. So we get the gig. David lied to him. He didn't even have a band. So he calls me up and says, you got to get down here. We got two weeks to get ready to go play this place. So <laughs> The luxury of not having the internet. You could just make up stuff. Like no <laughs> lie. And he did. I mean, he, he told, I don't know what all he told them, but they... They bought in. <laughs> so I get down there. I go all the way to Tampa. My wife is pregnant with my daughter. Oh, you're in trouble for oh, doing this. Yeah. Oh, dude. And I'm thinking, <laughs> this is the, one of the biggest risks I've ever taken in my life. So I get down there. We go to his house. I meet the other four musicians. None of us have ever played together. Not a note. And so... I told I'm, my my butt's clenching up just hearing this. My dude. my, I I told David I called him outside. I said, David, Jesus, man, can I can't believe you did this. He said, Don't worry, man, it's gonna work. I'm like, You better pray it does because you're playing one of the biggest clubs in Florida. You screw this up, and we'll never play another gig anywhere. Yeah. So we sit down. We start practicing and playing, and back then, a uh, big hit was a Glenn Campbell song called Gone, Gone, Gone. And so I just started playing it on the guitar. Steel player jumps right in. He's going, drummer. I mean, like, we're clicking. Bass player, and I was like, there's no way. There is no way this is going to work. For a solid week, we practiced, and I'm not exaggerating about what I'm fixing to tell you guys. Bass player never spoke a single word. Not one word. <laughs> Charted out songs. I mean, guy was killer bass player. So we take a break on about the fifth day. David and I are talking. I said, David, I don't know how you pulled this off because to me this is a miracle. And I mean, we're, we're having to learn like – almost 60 songs together as a group of course and i said but dude that bass player is one of the weirdest son of a guns i've ever i said that man no way man we're going out on the road this dude is just weird he's got bodies buried somewhere i said he said don't worry about it he said let's get through the gig and if we have to we'll find another bass player so i said okay great we go over and play Doodahs. We're there, like you said, seven nights a week. I mean, back then, that's you played six or seven nights a week at yes. a club, and you'd move on. Well, we signed a, a management deal with uh, Entertainment Concepts out of Orlando, and uh, he already had us booked all over the place. 
So we do the gig. We've gotten through. I think we played six nights there. We get through with the six night. Bass player still hadn't said not not a word, y'all, to nobody in the band. And so I'm so happy that it's over with. I'm up there drinking, having a good time, and cutting up and thinking, man, this this is just like a miracle. And we start telling jokes, and I started talking about what's the best line you ever used on a girl to get her to go home with you. And out of nowhere, the bass player goes, I thought there was only one. I'm so shocked that the guy <laughs> spoke that I wheel around and look at him, and I said, what's that? He said, how much do you charge? <laughs> I literally fell out of the bar stool on the floor, and I'm like, holy crap, the guy he spoke in a week. And this is the first words out of his mouth. But he turned out to be a heck of a guy, man. He was a great bass player. I think he was just – I don't know if he was Autistic just – Autistic or something. Oh, like yeah, that. well – he was an unbelievable artist too. He actually had made a lot of money doing uh, comic book. Yeah. He did the artwork, but he he was he was what a cool was guy. Uh, Lex Morris. He still oh. plays music all the time down around the Orlando area. Great bass player. Just not chatty. No, he's he's definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't open up after that and start talking more. He did. He did. And and, and uh, actually uh, roomed. Uh, we bought we uh we didn't buy we rented a house in daytona and he he stayed with us there and it, it became a lot more comfortable but i mean you guys think about it y'all play music have you ever done that you ever played music with somebody that didn't speak to you for no, no. i mean most I, of them speak too I mean, much could and you, then admitted yeah. that he gets prostitutes. Oh, yeah, I see how much. Yeah, you, yeah. Could, you could sit there and ask him a question, just looking at him in his eyes, and he wouldn't say a damn thing back. N- nothing, literally nothing. God, like that, that's like, rude as shit. Well, <laughs> it it just really weirded me out. I wasn't like I I took it as being rude. I'm just like, God, man, how can somebody do that? You know, you you'd say something about let's <laughs> let's do this song and. The first thing he'd want to do, which I'm glad. I mean, you know, the dude would chart it out, and he played it exactly like it was supposed to be played, which I'm not one of those guys that really wants to do that. I think you ought to do your own thing. Oh, but yeah. So we're out on the road, and David Spiegel has a nervous breakdown. And right in the middle of a gig in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, I mean, like, just literally has come apart. So I called the two ladies and I said, hey, David's lost it. I mean, like literally lost it. Y'all are going to have to come get him. And uh, I thought that was going to be the end of us. And the two ladies said, Ken, do you want to keep the band together? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And I I had never really been a front man in a band before. I was kind of like the comic relief in the group with David. I was the guy who cut up with all the customers and said all the crazy crap and you know, I just had a good time. I didn't have to stress out about the song list or, you know, it was just having fun. So I said, yeah, I'll do it. And all the band wanted to stay together. Well, Lone Rider, we became much bigger than we were ever going to be with David. And uh, when I got hooked up with Jeff, Rocky Lawrence had got us, uh, we had a Hat deal with Bailey, Bailey, a clothing deal with Wrangler. We had string deals, all kind of stuff. And uh, he said, I'm bringing down somebody from Nashville. They're going to sign you guys. And so seven years, guys, seven years, we busted our ass and traveled all over the place. When I tell you, we literally went Wilmington, North Carolina, out west, back down, Florida, we were we were burning it up. Yeah. Nobody in the band ever had said a word to me about us not doing that. So they show up. We're there to sign the contract. And the drummer and the lead guitar player both said, we can't do it. And the, I was so embarrassed, and Rocky was so mad at me. And What uh, part could they not do? They, they they didn't want to sign the contract, and they didn't want to be responsible for going out. And uh, the right. lead guitar player said, my wife will divorce me. She told me she would. He said, I can't do it. And the drummer just flat out said, I just don't want to sign the contract. So the guy gets up and looks at me and said, Ken, what's going on? I said, I swear to you, I have no idea. And so that night, 
when it was all said and done and Rocky was mad at me, I said, boys, that's it for me. I'm going to go back to school and finish up and be a chiropractor. And so, and and it really sucked because... You, were, you weren't interested in gathering up some other dudes? No, I was so frustrated that I had put as much time and effort as I had into it. And um, You just didn't think you could get that chemistry on stage? No, mm-hmm. I really didn't. And uh, the the guy that I was talking about early, earlier, P.J. Kimberlin, um, th- this was before the whole Lone Rider scenario. In 88, my brother knew this guy, and he said – man, this guy can help you guys get a record deal. And this is PJ and all the yeah. guys. I played with PJ. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So I'd never met the guy. The guy had never heard our music, never heard a single song. My brother convinced him. So he sets up a meeting with, I don't know if you guys know who Jimmy Velvet is, but he owned all the Elvis Presley stuff. He was a really smart guy. When Elvis passed away, he went around and bought up everything he could buy up that belonged to Elvis. He had the Elvis Museum in Nashville, and he owned more stuff than Graceland owned. They used to have to borrow stuff from him to do the uh, Elvis Week. But anyway, he owned American Sound Studios, which was one of the biggest studios in Nashville. Elvis had recorded there. I can't even name all the people that recorded there. So this guy named uh, uh, Steve Morgan agrees to take me up there we go to the airport in birmingham and he said ken i want you to look me in the face and i want you to tell me that your music's as good as your brother said it was i said dude i i can't do that he said listen i'm taking you to meet somebody who's going to sign you if you're as good as your brother said you are i said do i think our music's good yes do i think we're good enough i do but i said man don't don't put that kind of pressure on me. We load up in the plane, flying to Nashville, go to American Sound Studio. Jimmy Velvet sitting there. He wouldn't. He didn't even respond. He didn't even acknowledge we were there. He said, "Okay, put the tape in." So he puts the tape in, listens to about how nerve wracking is that? Moment? It was, and dude, I'm sitting back. Dude, why, there. Would, why didn't they do that before you got there? Just like so yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> And, and, and so I, I'm sitting back there. He's not saying anything. He let uh, about four songs roll through. He'd let a course in a verse or, and kill it and go to the next one. He spins around in the seat and he looks at me and he said, you're telling me that those four songs you wrote? I said, yeah, P.J. Kimberlin and I wrote them. And he said, nobody signed you and nobody uh, has any rights to any of the stuff. I said, no, nothing. And he said, all right. He turned around to the girl that was sitting there. He said, get them in here on, I think we were there in February. He said, get them in here in April. We're going to do a whole album. And I'm like, God, man. And this is the first time. And I'm like, man, what? how does, this doesn't happen to anybody. So this is when I told the lie. Because he (laughs) said to me, have you got a band? And I said, yes. (laughs) He knows the story. PJ and I, every song we'd ever written up until then, PJ lived in Oklahoma and I lived in Alabama. So we were passing songs back and forth to each other doing these songs. PJ's going in the studio in Oklahoma and cutting them. So we didn't have a band. What, What year is this? That was 88. That was in 1988. So how are y'all passing back and forth? What does that mean? We we literally would like either by mail or by phone. Wow. Like if we had a song and he was working on one, he'd call me up and say, okay, this is what I got. What do you think? Matter of fact, This Love's On Me was written while I was living in Cocoa Beach, Florida at the time. Uh, and he was still in Oklahoma. You're mailing tapes? Yes, yeah, it's and that's so crazy to think about. Now. I know, man. I mean, that's what you did back then. There was there was no other way to do it, and uh, well, I guess there was. But when you're talking about two poor guys, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's what that, and that's what we did. So, um, you know, when PJ said, "All right, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna move to Nashville," Steve Morgan said, "I'll get you guys a place." He got me an apartment on. Uh, Second Avenue is one of the real popular places for songwriters 
and stuff in Nashville. He got me an apartment. Just to do pre-production? and Yes. Yeah. 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 So we we spent a lot of time, but now they hired – they hired some big time musicians to come in and help do a fill in stuff on guys that could play circles around you. Oh Jesus! Listen, the the first day we were there, I don't care how good you think it made you, you want to quit. <laughs> you you get a lesson that is is very hard to swallow. A bunch of a bunch of union guys. Yeah, yeah. And and Jimmy would get them. They they call it off the card, and he would get guys to come in. Uh, I, I wish I could remember all those guys' names. I'm I'm talking about man. They played on so many albums. Yeah. So we get finished with the album, and we actually Jimmy already had a tour signed up for us to go to Australia with Jerry Lee Lewis, <laughs> and I'm like, man, this just cannot be happening. And three days after we finished the the album, Jimmy Velvet's wife called me and said. Ken, I've got some really bad news. And I'd went back to Alabama. I'd already was quitting my cop job and making plans to move. And she said, Steve Morgan's died. I said, what? She said, he went in for a minor surgery and died on the operating table. And I said, so are you are you going to call the whole thing off? She said, Jimmy said, no, he's going to bring you all to Nashville. And, uh, but we're not sure what's going to happen because Steve was going to be our manager. And uh, that I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's just how crazy life is. So things kind of fell apart, although Jimmy hired me to work at the Elvis Presley Museum. And let me tell you guys something. You want to you want to meet some strange people in this world? <laughs> oh, I know. I've, I've ran into them before. My God, listen. I, I, I'm going to tell you, you people obsessed with Elvis? Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, yeah. Listen. The, the the so so he he hires me to do it. I'm driving a tractor trailer truck with a trailer full, twenty one showcases of Elvis's stuff and one of his cars, and we go all over the country and set up in these malls or different places to do these shows. I got no idea what I'm doing. Seven million dollars worth of stuff in that trailer, Jesus. and 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 me and two other people are driving. The very first show that I ever did for them, we did in West Palm Beach, Florida. When we get there, they have to have security 24-7 to stay with all the stuff. We get it all set up. People are standing there waiting for us just to get set up. And so I get everything set up, and they say, okay, are you ready? And I'm like, well, I guess we're going to be because there's still people standing. They, they don't pay anything. The place pays just to put the stuff out there. Not kidding, y'all. One of the very first guys who walks up, jet black hair, sideburns, Elvis sunglasses, <laughs> walks up to me and, and says, I can't even remember his name, introduces himself and said, I'm an Elvis fan. And my, my first reaction was to go, <laughs> no shit. <laughs> but I didn't do it because I'm like, this is a new job. I need to be cool. So I'm like really cool with the guy. And then all of a sudden he just disappears. About 10 minutes later, he walks up with two kids, dead serious, looks at me, and says, I want you to meet my kids. This is Elvis, and this is Presley. I'm like, wow. oh, Jesus. Jesus, I can't. That, and and it, 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 it got weirder from there. Oh, hell. Those poor kids. Oh, I know, man. I mean, I mean, seriously, can you imagine? So we do a show in Wheeling, West Virginia, and uh, they get everything set up. And there is a crowd of people there. And here comes the television crew. And I could just tell that the guy was going to be a real smart ass. You, you just knew. And so he's asking me all these crazy Elvis questions. And then he says, okay, here's the million-dollar question. Is Elvis still alive? And, y'all, when I said no, a lady in the crowd literally physically attacked me and they had to get the cops <laughs> oh, damn. it was crazy i mean like she was serious gonna try to hurt me she was like no he's working at the waffle house in santa barbara california i saw him last week all right so i'm gonna lay i'm gonna lay one on y'all all right nobody has probably ever heard this story anywhere true story Jimmy Velvet went out on the road he was very close with Elvis he toured with him done a lot of stuff with him so I'd asked Jimmy one time, I said, you think he's, that he's dead? He said, I was at the funeral. I said, so do you believe he's dead? He said, yeah. 
Well, Jimmy calls me up one day and he says, you need to come over here to the house. He said, you're not going to believe this. So I get over there and I'm sitting down. And I can tell like Jimmy's really stressed out. He said, I just got a phone call from somebody who claimed they were Elvis. And I said, okay. He said, <laughs> here's the deal. He told me things that there's no way that anybody on the earth knew except Elvis Presley. I said, man, are you trying to, like, get some kind of story started? He said, no. He said, I don't even want this told. But true story, man, and I mean, it changed his mind. I mean, he literally was part of that deal at the funeral, and he firmly believed that Elvis was alive. He said, nobody could have told me those stories. Is this him on the TV? Jimmy Velvet? I believe it is. What year was it when he got that phone call? Uh, Let's see. That was... 80, I want to say it was 88 or 89, because I had moved up there, and I went to work, uh, and and it, it, it absolutely blew my mind that he actually told me the story, and I'm telling you guys, he firmly believed it. I think Jimmy's still alive. He had, uh, and I think they still do some of the shows and set up the stuff, but uh, so I'll, so so. Just quick, and and I'm I mean I know a little bit about Elvis, obviously, but what what was the deal? Why would why was there such a conspiracy on why he would have faked his death? Um, there there were a lot of stories that had gone around, and uh, of course the West brothers, who were part of the Memphis Mafia, yeah. had had kind of I guess I don't think turned on him is not a good word, but. Uh, Sonny, I think more than Red, had kind of turned on Elvis and came out with a lot of stuff about Elvis. Um, the rumor was that there were a, there was a lot of stuff that was known about drugs and a lot of other things that uh, I, Elvis's life was going to be in danger. Yeah, and so the FBI had gotten involved in it and. That was where the conspiracy came from that turned into they took him somewhere, got him out of the business. Um, you know, I, I don't know and I, I don't I don't speculate. Right. I, I, I just know what I know what Jimmy told me and I know that he firmly believed what he was telling. Yeah. But let, I, let me tell I'm gonna tell y'all that this is such a tragic story about the Elvis stuff. There was a young guy in Atlanta, really young, that came to Elvis Presley show and had on an outfit like Elvis. And I know y'all have seen the outfit I'm talking about. It's a Thunderbird yeah. that was on a white outfit that he wore, and he wore the cape with the great big Thunderbird. Yep. During that show, first Elvis took off the belt and gave it to the kid. Wow. And then as the show went on, at the end of the show, he took the cape off and gave it to the kid. So Jimmy had been trying to get that from that boy for years, and he wouldn't do it. In 80, what was the year Smokey and the Bandit? It was 77. 77? Yeah. Um, It was real soon after that. The kid had become 16 years old, and and, uh, Jimmy said, just tell me what you want for the cape and the belt. And the kid said, if you'll buy me a Smokey and the Bandit Trans Am, I'll give you the stuff. Jimmy bought him one. Two weeks later, the kid got killed in the car. Oh, no, oh, man. Yeah. No. And Jimmy never got over it because he'd done it. And uh, it, it, I was surprised that I ever got him to talk about it. I'd been told the story by somebody else. But, yeah. man, that was awful. Jesus. But uh, he, he bought up a lot of stuff. Uh, one of the famous pictures of Elvis with Muhammad Ali He's got on a lion's tooth necklace. Uh, I don't know. You probably can find that picture because it's super famous. Yeah. That necklace alone was worth, I think, like 700000 bucks. I mean, it was ridiculous, the amount of stuff that, yeah, that's it right there. Yep. But uh, it was one of the coolest jobs I ever had, but it was also one of the strangest jobs I've ever <laughs> held. And, uh, but I, I enjoyed doing it. Uh, we always met weird people, but you know, we, we also met some really cool people. I met the guy that was 
Elvis's bodyguard. Uh, I met uh, Red West. I met uh, Elvis's half brother, David Livingston. I can't remember what it. David Livingston something. He had written a book. Um, Anybody attached to him cast in that? Oh yeah, no, no it. doubt, no <laughs> doubt. Um, but yeah, that that was one of my cooler jobs in Nashville. You know, it, it, and I, I'm sure you guys know this, but it, it's funny. You move to Nashville, and you go to try to get a job. If you mention you're a musician, you're just SOL, right? Because they're not going to hire you. No, you're I, not going. You're not going to be there long. And I won't hire a musician. Yeah. I promise you. <laughs> yeah. I own a landscaping I'm, company. I've hired them. There's a reason. Yeah, because they're not going to be there long. Their work ethic is shit. Yeah, most of them. You're right, and they're not going to be there very long. And they're either. dummies. They they don't have any business sense. I mean, I'm sorry, musicians. That's no, it's wrong okay. with everybody in here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm talking to a room full of musicians, but seriously, they know the stereotype, and it is a little bit closer to home than they want to admit. So, man, another thing that's really interesting about you um, is that one. You know, at one point in your life, you were nominated for the Alabama Music Hall of Fame, um, and you got a, it was another award. What was the other award that you got? Alabama Musician not the, nomination. I got the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Alabama Music Awards in 2018, which was a big deal for me. Yeah. I mean, Lifetime Achievement means a lot to anybody, and I was really shocked when the guy called me, and I'm like, I know so, who some of the other people are, and uh, real, really, really honored to even be given something like that so when when they called you about that like i mean what i guess what was the basis behind them bringing you up for this award well uh literally and and you you said something interesting that i would never heard anybody say before i've i've been in music for so long and known so many people and i've helped a lot of people get their start i've helped a lot of people uh get in a lot of clubs and um i I'm one of those guys that I just had this conversation with somebody last night. If I had not had a break from people who cared enough about me yeah. to give me opportunities, I would have never I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. There's no way I would. You'd be a cop in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, right. That's about <laughs> that, unfortunately that's about right. So I've made a promise to myself a long time ago that anybody that ever talked to me or approached me about helping them, I would do it. Because if 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 you don't do it, who's going to do it? Are they going to get a break? Are they going to get discouraged and quit? And there's I've heard stories of some like unbelievable singers and musicians that almost quit if it hadn't been for somebody. So that's my that's my deal. And I had helped. Uh, I don't know if y'all remember who Shelby Z is. That yeah. was on American Idol and The Voice. She's one of the few people that ever was in the top 10 on both. Unbelievably talented girl. I saw her sing karaoke when she was 13 years old and absolutely blew me away. So I started spending a lot of time with Shelby yep. and uh, convinced her to do American. Uh, wait a minute. I think it was The Voice first. Which one is the one uh, Shelton's on? Yeah, the it's voice. The, yeah that's the, the Voice. Yeah, The Voice, yeah. So she got so far along in it that they came to Jasper and we filmed the whole segment and the girl who was there called me outside and said, look, she said that you're her mentor. We're going to fly you out to California and, and be part of the show. And I'm like, I, that's great. I, you know, I, I appreciate she said that. And the very next week they dropped her off the show oh. and it was because she had apparently not agreed to something that uh, Shelton had asked her to do, and boy, they dropped her. And I, I it broke my heart for her yeah. because I don't know if you guys have ever heard her sing. Yeah, I've seen her with you. Oh my God, yeah. it's unbelievable how talented you she is. You didn't find out what she wouldn't, what she didn't agree I, to. I never asked her. All I said was what happened, and uh, I, I, di I really didn't want to know. Really. And uh, I do. Well, <laughs> let me tell you, the audience something. does too. Shelby's you. quit altogether. She's involved with church, and she not the least bit interested. So uh, she had a baby, and I think it really changed her life. And that she will happen. that's that's the route she took, and uh, it makes me sick for her because there. I firmly, firmly believe she could have been a huge artist. Uh, well, that may not be over. 
Yeah, and, and, and you're right. Things happen with people. I, I don't know, but it really broke my heart for her. And, and then uh, the guy that had been heavily involved with the, uh, the voice moved over to American Idol, and he immediately called Shelby and said, hey, we want you to be on here too. And so uh, the only two people who'd, who've ever been on both and been in the top ten, both are from Alabama. One's from Summit and Shelby, and Dexter, uh, I can't think of Dexter's last name. That's embarrassing. Pay it. Pay it. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of talent in Alabama. But when they asked her to be on, she was doing super again. This wasn't her fault. Uh, they put her with somebody to sing a duet, and I can't remember what the guy's name was. And it, Bad pairing. It was a bad pairing. Oh, it was horrible pairing, and the song yeah. did not go over well, and they voted her out. Not, I, I hated that they did that to her because. Uh, well, look, those shows really. I mean, I tell you, uh, somebody as talented as her, and there's uh, lots of other people. It, it, unless they go out and do the road and get a stage you're right. time, you're right. That show is really. Uh, it, you can't make somebody. You can't give them the hours they need to be a seasoned musician. Yep. Like you going across country and just eating it. Just the kid playing. from Columbus, Mississippi that just got beat out. I think he was the runner up. Yeah. Uh, great talented guy. Uh, you know, I, but you can't replace stage time. No, you can't. And yeah. I, I, I see, I firmly believe that I've heard other people say, Oh, you don't have to do that. The you know hell what? You don't, I, I, you can, and, I can watch a guy and tell. I agree with you. That's, that's played in front of nobody for years and years and years and just it's just comfortable on the stage. Yeah, I agree with you. I you know people say oh you don't that pay your dues thing. Yeah, you pay you better pay your dues. How many hours on stage you got, Ken? Oh Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Let, less than for 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 that 7 year period 6 nights a week. I and for the last 2 years before that deal went down with the record deal, we worked 50 weeks a year. Jesus. We took two weeks off the, the, that whole time. The one blessing that we had was we were the house band at Billy Bob's, and she would let us, we would play six weeks and go out on the road for six weeks, and it broke up the monotony. Yeah. And and we, I mean, we had a great time. I played a lot of cool places, and, of course, all you guys, I mean, I could go on for hours telling – crazy stories about the road and <laughs> it, it, it's funny because people think everything That's what this about podcast food. is about by see the way. we're so wanting to hear some, uh, we want to hear the craziest one you've got yeah. i can't because <laughs> i'm married yeah, yeah, and yeah, my right. wife <laughs> okay. i'm sorry you know better Cooper, listen i love my wife and she knows i don't don't think she doesn't realize all right but well, she knows what she made i can't tell those stories yeah, she probably don't want to <laughs> but, hear it but I, I could i could tell y'all oh my god and I, I hear people they think that being a musician and traveling around is like the greatest life in the world i it tell can you the be, truth, it can be but it, it can it, also you well, dang right i mean hey we get we don't get paid to play we get paid to set up equipment that's and, right <laughs> you know and and i never had the luxury of having a roadie per se oh that's nice buddy let me yeah. tell you. i know it I, changes things a little bit i'm gonna go ahead and tell y'all you can kiss my ass because <laughs> i never got that even later in your career did you get to a point to where you did not get nervous on stage oh okay. i know some people that never lose that but i could not get nervous on the stage playing music if i if, you, if it was a million people, I tell you when I really get most nervous is when there's like three or four people in a bar. Totally agree. This is that's what I was about to say. I, I've played uh, several amphitheaters. The most we ever played for was about twenty five thousand people. We've played fifteen thousand people several times, but people call me that ask me to do funerals. Oh. Mm. Oh, oh my! That oh, me nervous as oh, gee, I never listen. get those phone calls. Yeah, oh, hey, as a comic, you <laughs> never get that. No, <laughs> you know hey, what? I'm listen, dude, I'm going go to go ahead and book them. I'm going to go ahead and tell you this right now. If you find out I've passed away, you're more than welcome because <laughs> I, I, I do a type five for it. I won't. I want people. I, I mean, I, one thing I don't regret, and I I don't care. I, I've told people this, and I I've got close friends that are heavily involved in church. 
I don't regret my life. I've lived my life exactly like I've wanted to live it, as hard as I wanted to live it. I've survived a heart attack, and I thank the Lord for that. But I, I, I just, man, it, it, we were put on this world to live life and live it the way God gave us the yeah. opportunity to live it. You can't take any of the money with you. So That's no. the truth, man. I, I just, you know, and I don't understand people who, who do that because I don't want to have any regrets. I really don't. I don't want to leave this world and i and oh believe me i'm gonna have a few regrets uh my my son is one my son and i don't have that close a relationship because i did take off and go out on the road and i i really wasn't there for him in his early years and he and i are not close now my daughter is my mini me attitude second, everything your yeah child. Yeah. yeah i learned a hard over. lesson from yeah. my son i really did and i regret i do regret that i regret it and i've Tried really hard to make amends with him, and it's just been really tough to do. And it that sucks. That it really does. sucks. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I can only imagine the pain that that must that you live with every day with that. I do, and I and I know that that uh, I'm I'm not going to be able to get that back. I, I really did. I tried a few years ago. I'm like, you know, just tell me, you know, what can you and I do? And right, I can only imagine. I, I was very cognizant of that when we had our child, and. I'm there during the week a lot, but, uh, and thank God he doesn't, you know, he's not athletic and doesn't want to do sports. So I'm not missing any games or anything, but I, I was very cognizant of that when my son was born that I, the, I've, you know, I've got a, we, we homeschool and, and so I'm around him a lot during the week, but that's awesome, man. Yeah. I, it, I could very easily see how that situation could yeah arise. well i got six grand boys now. Yeah. So whole oh, brother, right? <laughs> man, oh man. So, but, but I love it. So I want to. I want to. I want to tell a quick Ken Randolph story right now. Oh Jesus! It's not, it's not about it. it okay. this, this goes back to. Let's go get him divorced. No, yeah. no, 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 no. Please don't tell red. one of those. No, no it, 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 <laughs> it goes. It goes back to what we were talking about earlier when you made the comment that you were always willing to anybody that came to you, you were willing to help them out. And when this band gets sideways, David, this is before you got started and it got right. When we were on the cusp of getting started, there was a club we were trying to get into, and Ken played there all the time. He was a regular there. And I remember calling Ken and being like, hey, man, we're trying to get into this club. You know, is there anything you can do? And he was like, man, I tell you what. He's like, we're actually playing up there Friday night. He's like, get your band, come up here. He's like, while we're on break, you guys can get up there and play some songs for the for the club owner. And uh, so we're a good way to audition. Yeah, it is. So so we we did. He held true to his word. We got up there. We got to get up there. He let us play like three or four songs, and it helped us book the club. (laughs) You ever done that for somebody, and and they'd be terrible. Uh, and your reputation is well, high. and that's uh, funny. That's you, why I, won't, I don't like doing that. I, well, and and here's the deal, and I'm not going to call names. <laughs> no, but, you need to call names. No, so no, 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 no. <laughs> but but I I've had people who've called me, and I nicely figure out a way because I agree with you. It is your reputation, yeah. and and it can it could go I really bad. A bridge before doing that, but I can like. tell you, I trusted him 100, yeah. percent and I knew if he told me. They were what he said they were. They were what they said they were, and they were. They were really good. And I, I, I've had other people, but I've had people call me that I didn't even know, and they would say, "So and so told me you could help us." I'm just not going to step out and do that. No. And I've told. I'm always nice about. It. I'll say, "Hey, tell me where you're playing at. If I got time, I'll come hear you. Then maybe I can do that." And it sucks having to tell them, "Hey, I don't think you're ready." Well, I'm not going to put my name out there. I think you need a few more hours. Well, let, let me tell you this. My daughter would have loved nothing more than to do what I do. and But she's not that good. I love her, and she knows it. And I was very, very honest with her. She can dance like nobody's business. Mm-hmm. I mean, unbelievable. And she sings, and she's good, but she's not that level and i told her i said honey i love you first of all i didn't want her to do it but right. but i told her i said yeah you Look, don't want her to be broke all her life You're, yeah no kidding stay out of this business and that's the truth <laughs> um but uh i told her i said you're this is not something you're you're going to want to do I, and because it, it won't go 
like you want it to go. Right. If I can be that honest with my daughter, yeah. I got no qualms. Oh, about dude, it. that's who you're the most honest with. Well, I, I if I can do that with her, I can do that with anybody. But that's only the only the musician mentality though that would do that kind of thing. You know, tell your kid, be like, "Hey, you suck." Yeah. You know, well, you I didn't say that, it. but <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, she's not that bad. She's got up and sang with me on stage before, and she does good. But just I, you know. Was that from a? You're just trying to protect her. I was absolutely. Yeah, okay. You're right. No, okay. no question. Um, y'all all know this without me saying it. Man, this is an ugly business. It's gotten uglier. Well, I agree, I agree. I yeah. think it's gotten much worse. Yep. Um, I got to be careful about how I say this, but man, I don't know what's happened in this world. But people who think they want to own a club, Jesus. Right, Can they don't know what they're talking about. They I feel like doing. I could do it, but I would. Who would want to? Like, who would want to be the president too? Like, who first, wants all those troubles? First of all, life? why do you want to be part of a business you don't know a damn thing about? Oh, yeah. I mean, seriously, and it's obvious that they don't. Yeah, uh, th- this is. I, I'm not going to name the club, but this literally just happened to us. Th- this is how crazy this is. I found out about this club, and so I go talk to the people. And first of all, they didn't want to pay us what we wanted. Yeah. And she said, but What? I, you ran yeah. into that problem? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, oh, this gets better. So they hem hawed around for a while and she said, I've heard of the band and everybody in here always says, You gotta get this band, you gotta get this band. She said, We're gonna try it once. We go down there and play, line out the door, standing waiting to get in. They're not ready for it. Which I warned her. I, I said, I know you probably get other bands that tell you this. I said, but I'm telling you. They're if you, coming. If yeah. you don't have the staff here and you, you're not ready for this, this will not go good. Yeah. They didn't. And people were pissed. They couldn't get drinks. They, they had two bartenders that neither one of them really – was good at what they do and the only good bartender they had was sitting across the bar in the chair and she said it's not my night to work i'm not helping <laughs> oh damn so at the end of the night they've made bukus of money but they could have made way more <laughs> well they could have made a whole lot more but this is the kicker so they tell me this is what they say to me we just can't handle your band i'm like I've been doing this a long time, and I have never heard a club. Unfortunately, we hate money. Yeah. yeah. So give well, they in. Probably can't find workers. Honest to God. Well, I and I hear that a lot. I, but I, I mean, still, man, is that the best you can come up with? Right. Is that we we just can't handle your band? I'm like, man, I've been doing this a long time. That's a new one on me. Yeah. Is this Cooter Brown. Yeah. Cooter Brown yeah. band. Yep. So for those of y'all that don't know, Ken is the lead singer and uh, one of the guitar players for a band called the Cooter Brown Band. That's such a great band. Yep. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I got to tell this story. This is how the name came up. I played with a bunch of guys, and PJ was one of them. He, he's not going to mind me telling this. <laughs> Maybe not. Well, when I tell we'll you, <laughs> when I tell you, before the first set's over, everybody in the band's wasted except me. Now, I'm not joking. I'm talking about wasting. They're, all, they're hey, all the same age, generally. Yeah, uh, kind of, sort of. You yeah. got under. You got to understand who these guys are. They, yeah. These are some. These are some. You know. These are some country folks. And I mean heavy duty. Yep. We're talking. They'd rather drink shine than drink. Yep. Regular liquor. So. We got some shine right here for you. Oh, no, okay. uh, that's not. Uh, listen. <laughs> if I had realized, I would have brought y'all some real Walker County. I'm talking about. Take you down, moonshine. <laughs> I'll I'll get some to Jeff. You right. guys try. It. Oh, You're gonna we love take it. it all, buddy. I'm, I mean, I promise you. You drink this stuff, you'll be calling me like, okay, we need another load. <laughs> but anyway, so I'm I'm playing with these guys. One of the first gigs we ever do, we get there and the and I know the club owner was trying to be a nice guy, and he has two cases of beer sitting on the stage for the band. I looked at him. I said, that's the worst mistake you ever made. <laughs> and no joke. <laughs> I know my guys. Oh, you my, obviously don't. Oh, my God. Uh, it, and it was bad. And and the stage was only about this high off the dance floor. Yeah. So when, my, when the keyboard player would get drunk, he would lean way forward. And then when PJ would get drunk, he'd lean way back. <laughs> 
and chew on his tongue. <laughs> and so I'm standing. Think you all look like something out of Dukes of Hazard on stage. <laughs> <laughs> and I would lo- look. I'd look one that. direction, and one's leaning this way. I'd look the other one. And he's leaning back this way, and chewing the, on tongue. The the, the, night, the night just it, it would it would go south. So. This guy walks up to me one night and he says, "Dude, everybody in your band's drunk as Cooter Brown except you." And I said, "There we go. That's the name of the band." Yeah. And so we, for years, my my wife made me stop doing this. For years, we sold T-shirts that said, "Want to see my Cooter?" And then on the back, it'd say Cooter Brown Band. Dude, I'd get pictures from girls all over the country who'd got T-shirts. And they'd send me pictures of them in the T-shirts. And I I mean, we couldn't even keep those T-shirts. And I, and Your I made wife, it. Yoko Ono, the, the shirt oh, right out of the catalog. Oh, dude, she <laughs> shot it down. She's like, you are not selling those T-shirts. Well, you should say, I'm not wearing it. I'm just selling it. Well, It's paying for your purse that she, you got. She <laughs> sings with the band. And so it's oh, like, does it? oh, okay. yeah, it's like yeah. a personal thing. She's actually got a beautiful so voice. The- we're, we're lucky. How's the t-shirt sales going now? <laughs> In the background. Oh, oh no! You know, I thought about I thought about doing that, and I'm like, I, I started to tell one of the other guys, "Hey, man, I'll hire you to come, and you can sell. You can say you're the one doing the oh, t-shirts. Yeah. Hey, you're just a fan. Give me a, no, wait, wait, a no, cut no, of no. it." <laughs> so what? Was, I started what was to bring the, my wife with me. Y'all would understand why. What was your band's name before Cooter Brown? You know, I, I don't even truly remember what we were calling ourselves. That's that's, that's no joke. Damn right. <laughs> uh, and PJ drew up an old hillbilly with a, a moonshine jug that had triple X on it, and that was our that was our logo. I tell you, you talk about PJ, uh, dude. I've played some I've played some strange venues with PJ and, oh. and Eugene and Oh yeah. <laughs> You know, you like uh, walk into place. You're like, are you serious? Is this what we're fixing to do? <laughs> we're fixing to play here, and it would get people would bring. If we play, and it'd be like a potluck. People would bring like crock pots full of food and stuff, and it'd just be a straight up hoedown up in these places. Yeah, it, it, they uh, they played a lot more hardcore country places than I did. Yeah. You know, it's weird. We started out playing all country. The band I play with now, we got a horn section, and yeah. it's mainly classic rock and R and B, uh, and we, we throw in some country. I make jokes. I told everybody last night the gig we played on the Smith Lake. I'm like, don't ask us to play any of that skinny jeans country. Yeah, I just, right. I don't. I just don't care for it. But. Well, that's actually a thing in our show. Uh, David actually gets up and sings a couple of songs, and one of the songs that we do is uh, John Denver. And uh, I think his line is, is you know, we're not going to play any of that Florida Georgia line bullshit. Yeah. Let's play some real country if we're going to play it. Hey, I knew I knew those two boys when they were like 15 years old. I met them at a gig we did down in Florida, and I I would have uh, never dreamed they'd be where they were at. There, right, right there. There's the from 2015. There's the post where I put it on there. Get Sideways would like to thank Ken Randolph and the Cooter Brown Band for giving us an opportunity to showcase some of our music tonight at Lights House in Jasper. That's got one. If that ain't country, I'll kiss you. Right That's ass. it, baby. Hey, I was glad to do it, dude, man. It, it, it was fun. I, you know, like I said, I've had a, I've had a fun career. I, I've actually been in a couple of movies. You, you yeah, guys, yeah, yeah. you might have seen one of them. Yep. Invasion USA with Chuck Norris. Yep. I played a terrorist. Uh, I got the job. That? Huh? How'd you get that? Well, I I was a cop, and they were looking for people who had firearms experience. And I'll tell you exactly where it's at. When you look at the movie, you can you can see it. He drives the truck. There was a mall they were about to tear down outside of Atlanta called Americana Mall, and uh, so they hired all these people to shoot it up, tear it up, and then they were going to go ahead and tear it down. So Chuck Norris drives the truck through the mall. And as soon as he stops and jumps out, I'm the first guy he kills. I'm running in front of the (laughs) television set, and he shoots me, and they had me hooked up to this thing. So when he shot me, it, like, yank you down. Holy crap, man. (laughs) You really didn't bring in a stunt guy for that? They had you do it? Shit. They didn't have to. They got your chiropractor. They didn't have to. They didn't have to pay us like they pay those guys. What was the name of that? What was the name of the movie? Invasion USA. Invasion USA. It was a big movie. I think it was 80, 84. 
but it it was a uh, and it was a good movie. I you know Chuck was he was actually a really nice guy. But I'm gonna tell y'all, it's deceiving. He's a little. Guy. I was gonna I was gonna ask you if it was funny when you like when you first met him and you realized like he's little bitty. He I did, and I mean he really. I was like, man, this guy is really a badass to be this small. But uh, super super nice guy, super nice. And then uh, you were in that other movie. It was called what? The Bear. Yeah, about Bear Bryant. Yeah. And uh, the only two people in the whole movie that actually were from Alabama was me and uh, a guy named Ray Rhodes, who's a chiropractor in Tuscaloosa, and he actually played for Bear Bryant. And the movie people hired him to get football players. So. He got me – most of the guys that are in that movie actually played football at Georgia Tech. That's where most of the football players – the part that we filmed was when Bear Bryant was at Kentucky. And uh, I, I'll tell you all a funny story. I, I, didn't know I can't stand up. Yeah. Gary Busey played Bear Bryant. Oh, God. And I'm going to tell, tell you all something. You talk about a freaking funny yeah. guy. Hey, but I'm Gary Busey. <laughs> yeah. He, he's standing there with us, and, and they're shooting a, a scene, and we're standing on the sidelines talking. And just all of a sudden, he goes, hey, man, you guys know how one-armed man counts his change? And he literally runs his hand down and his finger through his zipper, and he's doing that. And the, <laughs> the director had a freaking come apart. He jumps up, and he's screaming and yelling, and Busey's just like. <laughs> oh, here's your mall scene. All right. When he when he uh, when he runs the truck right, right here. Well, I thought it was the first guy. I apologize, guys. There I am. Oh. <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> get get. I, I'll just ask you guys. Guess how much I got paid for that? Not a damn penny. Hundred and sixty dollars. Oh really? really? That's probably more than you get paid for it now. Hundred yeah. hundred and sixty bucks. You got man. to eat too, right? Man, yes. Hell, they overpaid great you. food. <laughs> great food, but that's what they paid all the extra guys. Hundred and sixty bucks. We had to stand in a line and shell it out. See, so I, you, I, so, oh, hell. I did that for a little so, while. Background in California. No kidding. Oh yeah, you didn't get paid. You don't get paid nowhere near that now. Are you serious? It's eight for eighty four. Eight eight hours, eighty four dollars. Oh my god. Oh, he's got it in slow mo yeah. here. Let's see if we can see see you run across the screen here in slow mo. What yeah, you got dude. going on, Dustin? Right here we are. Oh yeah, look at that. Look there you are. Shot. Look how fast you're running. You're just a blur on the screen. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> now, now I need to know what would you spend that hundred and sixty dollars on? Oh shit, I don't know, man. Oh, okay. <laughs> Listen, I was so uh, yeah. I, back then, a cop in Atlanta made like twenty one thousand dollars a year. So you can imagine, I wasn't rich. So what? May, I mean, so this is what me knowing you now, like I do. Like, I just don't picture you as a poli- – like, that just doesn't even, like, compute in my mind seeing you but, in a cop uh, outfit. Well, <laughs> I, there's probably one somewhere. I don't know if you're going to find it on the internet, but I don't want to bore you guys. But the first time I started chiropractic school was in 1980. Yeah. And I thought that's what I wanted to do, and I went through a horrible divorce. And uh, a buddy of mine said, Ken, you'd make a great cop. I was a junkie for just getting pumped up, and I thought, man, this will this will be great. Adrenaline like, junkie. Yeah, yeah, I really was. And uh, I, I'd gone through a bad time and just was like, I don't want to do this anymore. My dad was really upset at me because my dad was a chiropractor for like 60 years. He said, you, you ought to do it. And I thought, what the heck? So I dropped out of school, started, became a cop, and – I really did love it. I, I mean, I... How'd you end up in Georgia? That's where the school, the chiropractic school, Life University. Uh, okay. That's where Marietta, Georgia. Marietta, Marietta. for all you <laughs> for all you people. And, and uh, all you got to do when you go to Marietta, find a big chicken. You can get anywhere in Marietta. Yeah, I know Have y'all you, ever yep, seen that? Yep, I know exactly what you're talking about. The Kentucky way. Fried Chicken's oh, got yeah, this yeah, yeah. 40-foot chicken bird dies roll over and the beat goes up and down and literally that. when i moved there everybody says get directions from the big chicken <laughs> yeah, it's like finding the the flat iron building in new york and you know, or something yeah. Like, right? yeah yeah empire state building on the skyline okay i know where i'm at yep yeah but yeah i've it's it's been fun um the oh 
I enjoyed meeting Gary Busey. As strange <laughs> as everybody thinks the guy is, God, he was funny. It's funny you brought him up because I was literally just watching that movie, Silver Bullet. Yeah. The Stephen King movie. Yep. And he's in that movie, his role in that. So he's, he's so like, I don't know, man, he is a weird, he's kind of funny, but he's a weird, he's a weird guy, man. And he's just gotten weirder with age. Oh, no doubt. Like, if you see him now and, you know, in the media and stuff, you're just like, holy shit, what happened to that guy? Well, I definitely think the motorcycle accident got him pretty good. Yeah, I I believe so. But he had just, he literally had just made DC Cab when we were filming that movie. Yeah. And I made a joke about, and he did the Elvis thing he did in DC Cab about, I don't work on, what is it, November the... I forget what it was. Yeah. But he did that he did that after. He cut up with everybody, man. He had a great time. You know, like a lot of those guys and Chuck did it. They would go back to a trailer. Gary Busey hung out with all of us. Man, he just he was just having a good time. Uh, that's cool. So he wasn't above y'all, you know. No, not at all. Not at all. And I've yeah. been around a lot of people. I've I've been lucky to meet a lot of people and I used to know a lot of wrestlers because when I lived in Marietta uh, hey, he knows it. He said wrestlers, not yeah. wrestlers. No, I don't. <laughs> let, let me tell you. Pro, pro, there's wrestlers and then there's wrestlers. I see right? it. And, that, and that's the real deal. And, I, you know, people that I thought would be nice, uh, Dusty Rhodes was a jerk, absolute jerk, and I was so disappointed because uh, I didn't think well, that. Well, that's the thing about, you know, you got to choose when you meet – people that you admire they they have shit days just like you do you oh know? i know you that. meet them on those days and that yeah we always joke around there's probably somebody saying you know we were broke down on the side of the road and axel rose came over and helped us fucking switch the tire out <laughs> it's crazy it's the nicest guy ever but you know you hear all the nightmare stories about these people we did uh the amphitheater at birmingham with uh red what's it redneck woman what's her name I'm a redneck woman. Oh, oh. That's, uh, hell, who the hell is it? See, we all can't. Leanne no. Rhymes? No, 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 no. no, 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 no. Who the hell is See, oh, nobody can that. remember. There she is. <laughs> Look, it doesn't even give her a name. Yeah. Oh, Gretchen, Gretchen, Gretchen Wilson. Gretchen Wilson. Let me tell you. <laughs> okay. One of the rudest people I've ever met in my life. And she was so rude to all the people that she was supposed to meet. I said that night, her career is not going to last very long. And it, and it didn't. Yeah. Look at the I mean, bottom she left was, picture. Hell, she, she looks like a bitch. Horrible. <laughs> <laughs> we, lo- we love. That's what we have this podcast for: is to call people out on stuff. Like this. Look at she, she was. Bikes. She was the worst of the worst out of everybody I've ever met. I'm gonna tell y'all the coolest guy I ever met, John Travolta. Yeah. Oh, when I tell you guys, you talk about a cool guy. I used to eat breakfast late at night uh, outside of Daytona when we get through playing. And he was there a lot, and he had two huge-ass bodyguards from New York that went everywhere with him. And uh, everybody's like, oh, don't, you don't want to go over there. You don't want to go over there. So the first night I saw him, I just pulled up, and they were about to get in a Bentley. And I did the Saturday night thing, and he just cracked up laughing, man. I'm like, ah, this guy ain't that bad. So Did he hit on you? No, no. <laughs> oh, I know. What you- a, a, a few night, a few nights later, he's <laughs> sitting in there. Too. So I just walked over to the table and I said, "Hey, man, just wanted to meet you." And he said, "Hey, sit down." He started joking, cutting up with us. So I saw him a lot. He, he. Uh, there's a place outside of Daytona uh, called New Smyrna Fly In that he had a jet that I guess was bigger than. You were supposed to fly in and out of there, but he owned a house. Yeah. And they hated him because they <laughs> Oh, he had a runway him. in his backyard. Yeah. Yeah. I heard and, uh, that. I mean, dang, his wife, good looking boy. Kelly. Uh, yeah. I can't think Kelly of her. Presley. Listening. Well, you know, when but, you're John Travolta, it's not hard to get a good looking wife. Well, yeah, no shit. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he really, very genuine guy. I mean, he, Super nice. Super He's nice a Scientologist, guy. isn't he? Yeah. Yes, he, he is. is. He is. He that's did. that's the only thing I'm like. He didn't try to recruit. That was before he got involved with that. I'm sure. I don't know. Well, what year? What year did you meet him? Uh, that was when I was playing at Billy Bob. So that was like oh, early okay. '90s. Yeah, that's before was Scientology even a thing in there. Oh yeah, Lord, no! Yeah. Yeah. Well, Scientology's been around for a while. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, what's his name? L. Hubbard, whatever. Ron, Ron L. Hubbard. Yeah, he's he was around in like the '60s, man. Yeah. 
what was that first book he had? Something dynamic. Dynetics. Yeah, I see it. Dynetics, yeah. yeah. It was some crazy shit, man. Yeah, it was. So who's the most famous person you've ever met? Is it John? Who? Wait, Pro- here's a better question. Who's the most famous person in your phone right now? In my phone? Yeah. I got a lot. Um, that, hey, that, that will take your call. That well, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, I mean, obviously, the one that would answer my phone call, no matter what, just passed away, and that's Jeff. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I don't. I don't want to leave this program without saying something. Jeff literally was the backbone of Alabama. I don't know how much people really know about Alabama, but had it not been for Jeff, there wouldn't have been an Alabama because. They couldn't make it work until Randy convinced Jeff to come into that band. And this is something that a lot of people don't realize. The sound that Alabama had, Jeff is the one who came up with some of the stuff they did that they split in the studio to make Alabama sound like they sounded. But, um, you know, I know Randy's the front guy and everybody loves Randy, but I'm telling you guys, Jeff was the backbone of that band. And You think Randy I, knows that too? I, I do. Do I think you'd ever get him to admit that? Oh, no. I doubt it. But um, I will say this about Randy. I, as, as much as I don't care that much for Randy, and I, I've always been vocal about it, um, when Jeff really – started getting bad Mm -hmm. i saw a different side of randy and i was proud that i got to see it because i really did not believe that randy had it in him to be the person he was so i well i mean that comes with age in life you know yeah but uh you know i was the first person that diagnosed what was going on with jeff and i called lisa and said hey the more time i've spent around him i really think this is what's going on with him and they they took him and she called me and she said, "My God, Ken, you were right." And uh, they kept it quiet for a, a long time uh, before people even knew anything about it at all. And I swore I wasn't going to say anything. And uh, you know, the first time he went down to Mexico and had the stem cell stuff done, mm-hmm. he came back a different person. I mean, like it Isn't blew. That amazing. Oh my God, I could. I, I mean, seriously, I couldn't believe it. He Why would they the, not allow that here is the, what's so crazy. Are you kidding me, man? Pharmaceutical companies in this country. Oh, I mean, I know why. Don't get just, me started on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Trust me and believe. We could spend hours talking about that. Oh, I like know. That. But I, I, I'd be remiss not to talk about Jeff. I Look at that head of hair in this picture right here. He boy. did so many benefits <laughs> for me. And y'all can't imagine how many musicians that he did stuff for that nobody will ever know about because – he did not ever try to get publicity out of anything. Any of the benefits he ever played for me, he told me, I don't want you to make a big deal. I, I'll come do them. I'll do them for you. Never. Always a genuine guy with anybody. When he'd come in and sit in with us, super nice guy. I've I've played music with a lot of people in, in country music, and uh, nobody, nobody tops you, of course. Our relationship as far as fishing and stuff like that. I'll tell y'all a quick fishing story. All this right. is one of those you don't believe. Hmm. Me and him went with – do y'all know who Tommy Wilcox is? Okay. Got the outdoor show. He yeah. was a two-time All-American at Alabama. He invited us down to a place in South Alabama, and Hank Jr. was with us. And I'll tell y'all, Hank Jr. is a badass with a gun, boys. <laughs> <laughs> he is one heck of a shot. I'm not joking. That is not somebody you'd want to say, I'll do you. <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, so we go down to do this, and the, one of the guys who's filming us says to me, I got this place, and he said, I'd love for you and Jeff to come over and fish sometime. And, of course, I know me knowing Jeff like I do, I mean, Jeff gets to go fishing about anywhere he wants to. And, and – uh I didn't really say that much. I told Jeff, I said, hey, this guy invited us to fish. And he's like, nah, I don't know. So the next year rolls around. We were doing this yearly thing with Tommy Wilcox. And the guy says to me again, man, I wish you guys had come over and fish. So I told Jeff, I said, hey, man, the guy's a really nice guy. I said, Let, let's go over and let's at least go down there and go fishing. In six hours, 
132 bass. And out of the 132, only 30-something of them weighed less than 5 pounds, and the biggest majority of them weighed 8 to 12. Damn. So, Damn. what you what, tell us where this fishing hole is? We need to go. I need to hit this. <laughs> oh, it's not it was anymore. They just pond. emptied it. Yeah, no shit. There's yeah, nothing yeah. left. That was it. no, we, a and we didn't keep pond. any of them. Uh, the guy had such big bass in there. Auburn University came up to shock his lake because they didn't believe it and wanted to know how he had. And they all floated up. Man. Yeah, how he had Jeez. done that. Yeah, but. uh and then I took, I, I begged him to let me take my dad down there on his birthday, and my dad and another guy caught eighty-eight. I mean, it was unbelievable. I've, and, and this is this is the funny part of this story. So I'm thinking this got to be the best fishing day of his life. I looked man. at Jeff and I said, "Man, is this the best fishing you've ever done in your life?" He goes, "Nah." <laughs> I hate to be, I hate to be I did, the I, one. I was like, "God, man, really." I, I mean, I'll never forget this. this for the rest of my life. But I'm going to have caught bullshit on that. I'm serious. <laughs> there because is no way in hell y'all caught that many damn bass down there. God, like, that sounds awesome. Any lure. Any lure. Jeff had five rods laid out. He's just like taking turns. I'm not God, joking. That would be freaking fun. Oh, my oh, God. And and that'll never happen to me again, ever. <laughs> and and I, you, I, I realize that. Do you remember where the hell this place was? Oh, I know. I'm still friends with the Shit, guy. Let's oh, you go. think he's going to tell us? <laughs> let's Shit. go. I'll tell you what I'll do. <laughs> I, I will call Bobby and ask him, would he allow you guys to go fishing? Oh, yeah, David, you coming? Because if, I'm in, dude. if you, don't, you don't believe me, you're going you're gonna to see what I'm talking about. It's unbelievable. Seriously. Yeah. Is that what he does for a living? He sells uh fishing trips on his no that's his personal that's his personal baby if you don't get invited there i yeah. mean mm. you don't it, come yes yeah, by special invitation only wow Man. but uh yeah that, that was that was that was unbelievably cool yeah. so ken tell us what you got going on coming up with the band you got anything going on with the band you guys got some yeah gigs coming up you know what's funny we we had no intentions that it was going to work out this way but we're doing a lake tour this summer <laughs> right we've done smith lake That's logan great. martin um lake. lake gunnersville uh and and people just keep calling us to do these lake gigs which i i love them of course um I, i'll tell you something guys if you get a chance and you're up at lake gunnersville they've opened up a place up there that's yeah, got we've seen, we've seen it have you really oh yeah. my god the the place we play at literally is surrounded by water. It is the coolest. They won't book a band like us. I bet they will. No, they won't. They were they're booking older 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 acts. We've had a buddy of ours like the mayor of Gunnersville. He's usually here on the podcast, but uh, Brian's tried to he's tried to get younger acts in there, and they just they won't they, do they it. Won't oh, you talking it. about the new Harbor House over there? It's yeah. uh, Levi's on the Lake is the name of the place I'm talking okay. about. It's right next to Mike's Steakhouse. But now okay. we have an end, so things could change. You know? Listen, I'm playing there Friday night. I I, I can't promise, but I, I'll sure try. Yeah. I really like the guy, man. Yeah. I'm surprised that – but that's what the mayor told you? No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> he's not the mayor. We, oh. we call him the okay. mayor. Yeah. He, he's a guy that everybody in a, a, a Gunnersville knows. His okay. Brian Bond. He's a great guy, and he – He's really active on the music scene, and he he tries to get them to bring younger acts. They want a younger demographic down there walking yeah. around and doing business with them, and uh, he can't get them. You know, they they're stuck in classic rock and older, even older than that. It's a lot of oldies groups. He said that he has a problem with them. You know what? Now you now you got me on a mission, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can pull this off. Yeah, see if they want to hear a bunch of Taylor Swift shit. Y'all will either oh, say yeah. good things about me on another podcast or yeah, go that asshole. You know how this yeah. is gonna work while he's on break. <laughs> Y'all are going. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Well, Kim, man, I want to take the time to thank you for uh, oh, man, taking thank Sunday you. afternoon to come in and 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 talk with us. So, hey, but, I did all the talking. I, I'm no, sorry, yeah, guys. No, that's great, man. Was we didn't have to work today. You, yeah. you carried the pod for right. us. So, for those of y'all that you know don't know, you should check out Ken, the Cooter Brown Band. Um, Ken's actually got an album out that you guys should definitely check out called Fast Cars, Guitars, and Fine Tune Women. Um, so if you guys get a chance to listen to anything on this album, you should. And also, when we were talking earlier about his tribute to a soldier, this is also a really good tune that you guys should check out. Um, guys, I appreciate everybody being here. Ken, again. Thank you, brother. X5 Podcast out. Guys, we'll see you next week. Yeah.